you told me on Saturday that you would help me track this down and who it was. You made that promise to me before this person texted you and made and you promised them something. You have a promise to me before you have a promise to them. This person, this person, the I mean, you may be upset with me when I tell you this. This person sent me sent it to me because I asked him to. I asked him to because I wanted to be prepared to defend you. Who did you ask? I'm not going to tell you. On April 1st, 2022, the Bucks were living in a nightmare. Unknown, nameless people were passing around Jennifer's rough draft without her consent. Their private information is now exposed bare to the dark forces in the SBC. Pastor Tom began to receive phone calls saying that Jennifer's rough draft has been sent to news outlets, and he best keep quiet about his conversation with Willie Rice. A lot of people have not served us well if my rough draft has been passed around and nobody, nobody has called us. Not one person called us and said, this is what's going on other than to get the threat that you better keep your mouth shut or it's gonna be dropped. Threats were made, words were twisted, nowhere to go. Not knowing what to do, Tom contacted Rachel Denhollinger on April 1st of the threats he had been receiving, to which Rachel gave a very long but informative message that Karen Pryor had called her yesterday on March 31st, to which Karen informed Rachel that a third party approached her to verify the rough draft. She reached out to me because someone contacted her third hand, asking her to verify that she got that draft from you. She doesn't know who had the other person reach out. She called me because of my background in the abuse arena, not knowing I knew you. She felt very strongly that it was wrong for that piece to go out and was questioning the timing. With this information, Tom and Jennifer knew that they needed to contact Karen Pryor as soon as possible. We don't have a good reason to believe we would ever known that they went to Keith and Karen if Rachel hadn't told us that Karen had called, talked to her. And that's how we knew to reach out to Karen. Tom and Jennifer then contacted Karen on April 2nd, demanding to know who approached her, to which she refused because she didn't trust Tom and was trying to protect Keith. I've already said that I, that you knew that I wasn't going to tell you, right? Because I said I wasn't going to tell you. I, I was being honest and saying I wasn't going to tell you. And you know now who it was. So yes, I was trying to protect him. Protect right? him from what? I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> And when Jennifer begged Karen to reveal who the third party was that approached her, Karen Pryor instead laid the blame at Jennifer's feet. And Karen said to her, they were your words, Jennifer. And my mom said you should never put in writing what you don't want the whole world to read. Realizing Karen is refusing to help, Tom and Jennifer then contacted Dr. Aiken the same evening. Dr. Danny Aiken is the president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary and also Keith Whitfield's superior. Pastor Tom informed Danny of the ongoing blackmail and horrible mistreatment Karen gave to Jennifer. Dr. Aiken then said he'll get to the bottom of this and will have Karen reveal who was the third party. So when you called me that Saturday night, I immediately before the Duke Carolina game was over, I called Keith. Dr. Aiken immediately then called Keith Whitfield, who is Karen Pryor's boss, and demanded Keith to get Karen to reveal who approached her. And said, I want you to get in touch with Karen and make sure that no one is going to get this story out because it would be wrong, which we all agree right. would be wrong to happen. And I really would like to know who. Uh, this party is. Unbeknownst to Dr. Aiken, Keith Whitfield was the third party. Keith did not reveal to Dr. Aiken that he was the one that approached Karen to authenticate the rough draft. Instead, he lied to Dr. Aiken that he will get to the bottom of this, and Keith will hide this truth for the next 15 days, until on April 17th, when he finally tells Dr. Aiken. Keith calls me and says, I need to share something with you. And I said, okay, what is it? He said, I'm the person that contacted Karen. 
and needless to say, I was not happy. Because in Keith's mind, he believes he wasn't lying to Dr. Aiken. He was just withholding information. We can talk about whether I lied to Dr. Aiken or not. I don't believe that I did. Um, I do believe I withheld information from him that I had. But according to Danny Aiken, he believes Keith did lie to him. And I'll tell you this, Tom, if, if it does come out somehow that Keith was the one who did all this, I will fire him. I will absolutely terminate him. He did lie to me for the brief acted with high-handed sinfulness and uh, uh, complete uh, unethicalness, and I would fire him. At this point, it is worthy to consider why the mistreatment Keith and Karen are giving to the Bucks. Why are they doing this? What will motivate them to do such a thing? Could it be because this isn't the first skirmish with Pastor Tom? If we jump back to the year 2019, on October 24th, Southeastern officially announced that Karen Pryor was hired to be the research professor of English and Christianity and culture. Southeastern was a very important institution in the Southern Baptist Convention, and many were opposed to Karen's hiring at Southeastern and saw it as a compromise. You may not remember this, but when Karen was coming to be uh, coming to Southeastern, I was opposed adamantly against her coming there. I was opposed, I wrote a letter to you and Keith, and I sent it to you guys about my concerns with her connections to Revoice. Karen Pryor's endorsement for organizations that affirm the gay Christian movement, such as Revoice and the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender, sparked concerns that the college could drift leftward. I don't remember how long ago it was, but recently there was the announcement that Karen Swallow Pryor was hired ago, I think. Um, by Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And um, when I received that announcement, I thought that it seemed like a watershed moment to me because um, the people that I know and trust and read uh, have been saying that Revoice is a fundamentally flawed conference. Even Tom Askell, who is a good friend of Tom Buck and one of the future presidential nominees of 2022, wrote to Cam Pryor in private on October 25th, 2019. Dr. Askell asked Karen directly if she renounced Revoice, but didn't get a satisfactory answer. She responded in an email the next day expressing her views on caring for those who are same-sex attracted, and giving some explanation about why she had endorsed Revoice. Though she did not answer my question, I appreciated what she wrote. Karen was unclear of whether she retracted her position of Revoice. It wasn't until less than a month later, on November 18th, 2019, when a video surfaced of Karen Pryor being interviewed by Biblical Recorder, to which, in the interview, she still affirmed Revoice's mission. You know, I do understand why the Revoice conference is problematic. I understand why, um, uh, especially after the fact, after after it, it took place, but I still support um, its mission of helping um, Christians live faithfully uh, regardless of what their sexual struggles are. This prompted Dr. Askell to write a lengthy article on November 20th, calling out Danny Aiken for hiring Karen Pryor. Yet, President Danny Aiken, president of Southeastern, has hired Dr. Karen Swallow Pryor to teach at his school when she has unapologetically endorsed a conference that, in the words of Dr. Butterfield, promotes a different religion. And he expects Southern Baptists to sit back quietly and pay her salary. This article sparked a reaction from many. Tom Buck, on November 22, in a Twitter thread, publicly called out Danny Aiken and Karen Pryor by saying, Karen and others think we misunderstand and misrepresent Revoice. So here's the challenge. I want to give Danny Aiken and the trustees of Southeastern listen to one talk at Revoice, Redeeming Queer Culture and Adventure, and tell us if you can still defend this movement. The combination of Tom Askell's article and Pastor Buck's Twitter thread brought a lot of heat to Karen Pryor, so much so that she privately messaged Tom Buck her frustration with Tom's behavior. Remember when you wrote this to me? To which she shared a photo of a previous message of Tom Buck. It shows Tom saying, 
if she was hired as a professor at an SBC seminary, he wouldn't call for her termination like he did for the ERLC. She looks at where I'd said something in the past and she's right about th four or five months prior to that. She's right, I did say that. But I'm thinking in the time, she, teaching English. So when she comes to your all's school, she was really, in my opinion, being promoted for more, by, uh, more than that. And so I didn't feel she should serve there. Even Tom Buck wrote back to Karen admitting his inconsistency. Yes, I believe I allowed my love for you as a friend, which I still do, to cloud my vision in what I said there. And I think you are allowing your love for many and those in Revoice to cloud your vision. Everything I said above I still agree with, except for thinking it would be okay for you to teach at an SBC seminary. So I retract that and wish you would retract your support of Revoice. It's dangerous, Karen. But Karen wrote back to Tom, Your love for me as a friend had nothing to do with an unsolicited distinction you drew between ERLC fellow and seminary. And that distinction has nothing to do with Revoice. I haven't changed my views or positions. I endorsed a conference before it happened and refused further requests to partner with them afterward and have stated so. You have been inconsistent and proven untrustworthy. I'm grieved by that. And then Karen concluded the conversation by saying, Tom, I'm so grieved and frankly afraid of you now that I can't respond. And this grief led Karen 15 minutes later out of anger to publish Tom Askell's private October 25th email publicly on Twitter. It is frustrating and wrong to consistently receive kind words in private followed by uncharitable attacks in public by Buck and Askell. Whatever political purposes they have or whatever platform they're trying to build, I want no part in it. Dr. Pryor released those private emails, you know, so as if that were a smoking gun uh, that right. somehow outed me, which doesn't at all. All it does is, you know, violates the sense of privacy you have whenever you're having communications like that. But n nevertheless, the issue remains. Th this is a serious thing. Revoice is poison. If Karen Pryor's anger towards Tom Askell is enough for her to share private emails publicly on Twitter, could it be that she is also willing to share Jennifer's rough draft to others, such as Keith Whitfield, to shame Pastor Tom? But have you sent it to anybody in the last year? Or well, two years. Okay. Since, 20, last year. since November 22nd of 2019. I don't think so. What about Keith Whitfield? Well, the next day after Karen publishes Askell's emails, Keith Whitfield responded back to Pastor Tom. Keith Whitfield defended Karen Pryor and didn't see her endorsements as problematic and did not appreciate how Pastor Tom interacts with people who disagree with him. There's room for disagreement on these issues. It seems to me that disagreement is over the way and wisdom she and others interact given the broader cultural landscape and not her or others' convictions. I have concerns with the way you interact given the broader cultural landscape. I often don't think it is wise. I don't paint you in a corner with every disagreement. It is disheartening to be treated or my friends to be treated as the enemy. I do not question Karen's convictions. This text message is very revealing because it shows that Keith Whitfield sees Tom Buck as a person who intimidates his friends and treats them as his enemies, which, if applied to what happens in 2022, it makes Keith's actions more sense. We know that Keith Whitfield is one of Willie really Rice's friends who encouraged him to run for the SBC presidency. And we know that Keith was one of the only two SBC convention leaders that knew immediately about the meeting with Willie Rice and Tom Buck. Could it be that Keith saw Pastor Tom approaching Willie as another example of Tom intimidating one of his friends? And we know that Tom Askell was one of the SBC presidential nominees of 2022 and one of Tom Buck's friends and supporters. And we know from the audio recording from Danny Aiken that Keith Whitfield is dangerously involved with SBC politics. Could it be that Keith saw Pastor Tom's approach to Willie as an attempt to politically undermine Willie's campaign? And even the language of this text message in 2019 is similar to the anonymous email sent to BNG in 2022. I am sending this anonymously because I know Pastor Buck and I've seen up close the way he will bully, attack, and intimidate people 
he sees as enemies. Could it be that Keith Whitfield was involved in sending Jennifer's rough draft to B&G? Is that why he approached Karen to authenticate the rough draft when it didn't work? Could it be he deleted the phone number to protect himself and cover up his trail? And why he lied to Dr. Aiken for 15 days? Could it be that all of this was why he refused to help Pastor Tom and Jennifer Buck? Could it be he is the reason for this whole fiasco? If only there was an investigation. Between April 2nd and April 7th, there was just silence from Dr. Aiken, Karen Pryor, or Keith Whitfield. Danny Aiken became sick with COVID on April 3rd and was almost hospitalized. And that, by the way, and I'm not making an excuse, is when I began to uh, come down with all the symptoms of COVID. It was so serious for me. They thought about me going to the hospital. I didn't leave the house for 12 days. As a result, he was unable to effectively help the Bucks. Everywhere Jennifer and Tom Buck looked for answers, they just kept getting threats and dead ends. You may be upset with me when I tell you this. This person sent me, sent it to me because I asked him to. I asked him to because I wanted to be prepared to defend you. Who did you ask? I'm not going to tell you. On April 6, Willie Rice on Twitter publicly stepped down as the presidential nominee for the SBC convention and saw that his primary duty now is to the local church, my family, and to the mission field God has given me. I wish to return my time and attention to those things. Later that day, Keith then calls Dr. Aiken, and the account that took place is admittedly confusing. Keith claims that Karen has refused to reveal who the third party is to him, but Karen denies that she did this. Either way, Keith and Karen's independent accounts just simply conflict with one another. Yeah, so what I was asking Karen is why when when Keith came and asked you that Dan, Dr. Aiken wanted to know who the third party was, why did you send the message back that I don't want Dr. Aiken to know or I'm not going to tell him? I didn't do that. What? Well, that's what, what Keith, that's what Keith told Dr. Aiken you did. Is that what he just said just now? What? I, yes. I don't. He said that you still did not want to involve anybody else in it and did not want that third party you're not you didn't want the third party to be no i i i don't know i don't have i don't know what that communication was i don't I, 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 I don't know. But Keith assured Dr. Aiken that the draft will not get verified to the media. But how can Keith know that unless he knew Karen Pryor was the only one that could verify it? Because of the silence from Southeastern, Jennifer feared that the blackmail was still underway and not wanting the sinful actions of a few people eclipse her desire to share the beautiful story of God's redemptive work in their marriage. Jennifer decided now was a good time to publish the story. And on April 7th, Jennifer published a completed story on G3 Ministries' website, to which many people were blessed by it. Later that day, Danny Aiken texts Tom, assuring him the draft will not get verified. But this proved to be disingenuous. The dark forces in the SBC were on the move, and the blackmail was still underway. And on April 11th, the BNG published their article smearing Tom, his wife, and his ministry and all hell broke loose. I have had to sit by and watch as Tom has been maligned. I have been made fun of, and the intention and purpose of my article has been twisted by an intentional hit piece. And not one acting leader has publicly spoken in our defense. We have been hung out to dry by the very people who have the power to change the conversation and the dynamic of the game. I am deeply hurt. I am deeply angry. I am deeply disillusioned with this process. I don't want to hear any sentiments about my pain. I want to see evidence that somebody is willing to actually do something more than lip service. I believe we have been mistreated as fellow believers in Christ. I believe I have mistreated as a survivor by the leaders at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And I believe the testimony of Christ has been damaged. And this entire situation has been mishandled in egregious ways. 